there is a tool, basically uh, Bonnie Plus Plus. Anybody used Bonnie Plus Plus? Yeah, so it's, a, it's an old testing tool, been around for a while. There is a, there is a tool that's kind of like an add-on for it that's called ZCAP. So it basically uh, does its constant angular velocity and testing. So it basically goes through the process of testing the zone tables to see what's the fastest, displays it to you, and then you can make a determination about dividing that disk up. Now, it may still be a little bit harder for you to say, oh, I got you know, F disk, and I'm going to go divide up this partition this way or something. But, uh, but at least you'll know, and you can kind of work through it. This is what it looks like. So I got the link there for where it came from and stuff. But they've done some testing to figure out in the zones and so at the beginning of the zone tables, you can actually see what the speed is and how that affects the drive itself as you get closer to the center of the spindle. So they actually have a chart, and it'll break it down for you. It'll tell you every, every block and everything you need to know. So, uh, so you can actually work through it yourself. Now, just to kind of give you guys the idea here, <coughs> um, and this applies to the previous number one item that I had, which was uh, about secure wiping. Secure wiping will not work if you are plugged into a... USB drive. If you plug it physically into the USB cable, it has to be on the motherboard. On the USB cable, you cannot apply the entire ATA command set. It's actually using a driver in your operating system to communicate through USB in most cases to make that happen. So this is a chart that shows you the difference in speed on your hard drive plugged in through a USB cable versus plugged into an ATA controller. So if that tells you anything, I mean, at the slowest part, it's still faster than the fastest part of that drive. Uh, and it, so it's going to be a lot more consistent from a speed standpoint, but it's going to be slower all the way across for USB versus an IDE cable. So, so you still might want to pay attention to that if you're actually optimizing for speed. OK? <clears throat> all right, so my next one. <clears throat> Again, if you're optimizing for speed, when you go to the store and you buy a hard drive or you have this old hard drive that's sitting over in a corner that you ripped out of a machine earlier and you want to reuse this drive, you don't want to reuse it in its current state. I mean, maybe that drive was in a machine for two years and you're setting up a testing lab or something, but you want to make it as fast as possible. You don't want any of these weak sectors that are starting to die that have been written to so many times that they're starting to have problems. So you want to identify those and get rid of them. Just kill those sectors. There actually is a way to do that. There are certain programs. This is a free program called MHDD. Um, it is from harddriveguru.com. And it can actually analyze the sectors, tell you which ones are slower. And you can control what slow means. And you can tell it to whack them. And what it does when it whacks them is it puts them in that G list that I described earlier. It says, OK, fine, this is a, this is a slow sector. And uh, so for instance, most sectors on new drives will respond in something like under 10 milliseconds. They, it is acceptable for a sector to respond all the way up to normally around 600 milliseconds. That's quite a change. You can actually have a tremendously slow drive that's still functional and works. And basically, it'll just kind of pause as it's writing. And some of you have probably seen it, but not even known what it was doing. But uh, so ultimately, this device, uh, you can control with this software on your motherboard the, the, the speed that you want to say. So I want everything, say, below 150 milliseconds. And you could see from the previous zone table that I included that the closer you get to the center of the disk, the slower that it's going to get. So if you set this number too slow, you're going to whack like half your disk, just so you know, especially if it's like a laptop hard drive. I mean, you've got a lot less of an area that you have some content on. So be cautious about what that number is before you whack it. Uh, because uh, once you add it to the G list, it's going to take some extra work to get it out of the G list, just so you know. Uh, you'll just lose half, and you'll come back you know, two days later, and it's all gone. <laughs> so you have a 30 meg drive out of a 200 gig. Uh, anyway, <clears throat> it, it will be fast. It will be fast. If you want to make a solid state, no. <laughs> you know, actually, solid state responds in like two milliseconds, so you're pretty, it's still not going to be fast enough. Uh, so anyway, so pay attention to that. But this is basically what it looks like. This is a little bit older screenshot. They have a, a, a newer screenshot. Now, some of this will look a little scary. In the data recovery world, we use all these flags all the time for what type of blocks and stuff we're looking for. It's a great diagnostics tool. It's the closest tool to a true data recovery setup as well. And so I, I urge you guys to use this from a standpoint if you're doing any kind of diagnostics. The really cool thing about this tool is that it talks over the ATA command set. 
So if you have a drive that does not show up in the BIOS of your machine, that doesn't mean you can't talk to it. You guys understand that? You boot, look in the BIOS, oh, my drive's not there. That doesn't mean you can't talk to it. If you have it connected to the ATA controller and you can supply a command to it, you might be able to communicate with this drive and carve out data, do a backup. And this thing has the ability to read the files out and spit it through another drive. Or it doesn't do files, it does sector, so you can write out content. So you can write out a section or LBA blocks or something like that. But we're dealing at it at a lower level than the operating system. So it doesn't matter what operating system you have. So this will work fine. You know, if you got a Mac and you need a floppy, you might still have to go to a PC to do it. But outside of that, uh, and you can you can destructively get rid of those erase weights. Um, and it'll actually have a little destructive flag now. It'll tell you, I'm going to destroy these sectors. And it'll fly through the device. It'll start looking at the content. It'll tell you a lot of information. I mean, you can see drive, support, LBAs. Um, if anybody's dealing with ATA passwords, and, and in some cases, if you need to know the ATA password, you might still have to struggle with some things, but you can clear the ATA password. So for instance, in the machine, in the BIOS, when you type in that ATA password, maybe you know that password, but now that machine is dead. Something happened to that machine. You can plug it into the motherboard. With this software, you can type the password in and clear that password. There's other software that'll do it, but at least it's there. So we're kind of covering the same stuff. And it looks like this. So basically, you can say, while you're running, each one of these is a sector or a group of sectors, and it'll, it'll colorize them based on how many milliseconds they actually take to respond. So I can kill anything that's slower as it crawls through the device. So I think that's pretty cool, but you should recondition your drives this way. It is not erasing that content that you're, uh, that you're testing or, or wiping. So you may still need to go back and wipe with a secure erase tool so that you can use that in conjunction with this to make sure your data is gone before you've reuse this drive, or sell it on eBay. So, because that's the first thing guys would, you know, get them from eBay do, is they go run a test like this to see how many bad blocks they have, so they can complain and say, you know, give me some money back or send me a new drive. Uh, if you run this before you sell it on eBay, there won't be any, just so you know. <clears throat> okay, too many secrets. Okay, so. Now this one's just kind of a, a fun thing. This is, to me, it's just kind of the, you know, a lot of people talk about journaling and making sure that the critical content's written in the journal and, you know, uh, you know, super blocks, things like that, they're all taken care of or journaling's done correctly. But then you, when you get to HFS Plus for a Mac, we're talking about Macs here, basically in the catalog, this to me is the dumbest thing that you would need to journal, okay? Imagine if every time that you are on a Windows machine, that you opened Explorer and closed it, that it wrote that content into the journal right next to the valuable file information about where my file is. Because the journal's supposed to protect your operating system in case of failure. So it's supposed to write as little information as possible. Well, on Mac OS X, when you close the Finder window, it writes the X and Y coordinates in the catalog file in the journal of every time you open and close that box. So seriously, nope, I'm not kidding. So. So just so you can see, I'm actually looking at content. I'm looking at the content in the catalog file, and you'll actually see stuff that's the finder info, the scroll position, stuff like that. You'll see content that's, uh, even for files like this particular one, is an RTF. It still has the location that you can actually store that content for the fi finder's info in there. I just think that that's kind of, uh, anybody do operating system design? No? Mm, that's too bad. So. <laughs> But it updates it. It's there. So, and uh, this is a free tool that you can use to go. It's called uh, uh, HFS Explorer or something. And you can use HFS Explorer to go and look at this content if you don't believe me. <clears throat> All right, so now we're down to number five. Now, this is something, uh, Linux, how many people? <laughs> Mac, how many people? OK. All right, how many people do both? Yeah. Okay, and Windows. All right, how many Vista users? Just to. <laughs> All righty, okay. So, <clears throat> so anyway, so uh, just so you know, a lot of people go out there and they say, "Oh, look, uh, you know, if something bad happened to my Linux box, I need a data recovery tool for it." They go looking for EXT3 tools to go and recover content. There technically is no such thing from a standpoint of data recovery. This is really cool to me that there was enough forethought.